instead of it. We're gonna sit the tub in place and put water in it. And by this, that way, what we're doing is two purposes. One, it gives the cushion that holds it nice and firm, especially when the foam dries. And two, it gives that thermal break underneath the tub. So if it's ever cold in the winter, it doesn't feel cold in the tub. We only get one chance at this, so we're gonna place the tub in place. Let's watch our turn. Yeah. Hold this end up. One end up anyways, not wrong end, okay. Got that in for a sec? Wait, uh, the other, yeah. wait. Okay. Get a drop cloth on there. A drop Can cloth. Can look at the foam from the outside? Sure, and, but we will put in a drop cloth and some heavy sandbags, that'll okay. do. Okay. Either that or water. The foam's perfect, it's nicely sealed under the tub. It'll continue to slightly expand, bond to the tub and bond to the concrete. Three, so we have one here. Let's hope the wind doesn't blow them over. Looks like they may have that fire under control. But could you imagine if it actually came this way? I'm telling you. I don't even want to think about it. The wind's blowing this way. You can see how it just carries it over and it crosses it back this way. So over the hills, it's going that way, but as it gets to here, it's coming this way. That's a big fire. I love this system. This is great. It's gonna look well, nice. imagine being up here and you can see through the glass, hopefully looking at hills and not fires. Yeah. We're gonna set the posts Everything for the uh, fencing here, it's the beautiful glass rails. It's really going to be the cream to the creme. It'll be gorgeous. And it's not easy. It's time consuming because it's not like I can just lock down all the posts and then put in the cross ties. I actually first have to map it out. Then I'll start from one end. And as I go, I'll start bolting in, getting in the top, getting in the bottom, prep ahead for the spacers and for the uh, gaskets that hold the glass. Set your depth on all the drill bit for uh, four and three quarters, and just okay. try and be on the money, okay? okay. Then we'll blow out the hole, we'll epoxy them in. To use your template, Yeah. put them in, and then pull the template up, okay? And then go on okay. to the next one. Okay. Because that way you're set on the money. I think it's starting to light up again. Oh, it's coming over the hill, look at that. That is not a good sign. That's a great problem. Right. This hard was too hard. Mahogany. Cut on the table saw, everybody will leave because your lungs hurt, everything. Success! And that's some hard wood. You got it. Is it still right there? You got it. Beautiful. Sweet. We're all good. It's 30 days of ideas and inspiration. Candace Olsen and the Divine Design crew get in the spirit. An all-new episode of Divine Design, the day after Thanksgiving at 8, 7 central. Part of 30 Days of Holidays on HGTV. Find your space on an all-new episode of Ferrant, Monday at 10.30 on HGTV. Holiday Gift Rush, brought to you by Crayola. Enjoy some magical moments this holiday season with these gift ideas for kids. It's great being able to say yes. And with the mess-free fun of the Color Wonder Magic Light Brush, you can. It glows and shows the color only on the special paper, so he can paint anytime, anywhere. Wow! He'll have crazy fun creating his own 3D light show with the Color Explosion Glow Dome. It's a flashing, floating world of spinning fun. Wow! <laughs> have a lot of laughs together with Color Me a Song. The faster she scribbles, the faster the music plays, and she'll love adding new instruments. It'll be playtime for a long time with all these ideas. Holiday Gift Rush, brought to you by Crayola. Give the gift of creativity, give everything imaginable. Your future looks very bright. <laughs> <laughs> hanging over my head, I hope he 
New from Crayola, it's the Color Explosion Glow Dome. A spinning, glowing dome that brings all your best ideas to life. Give the gift of creativity with the Color Explosion Glow Dome and other great gift ideas from Crayola. Give more than presents. Give everything imaginable. It's a revolutionary product. The secret of youthful skin is in your genes. Lancome invents Genifique, youth activating concentrate. Drop by drop, see the transformation. Clinically proven, see visibly younger skin in just seven days. It's like youthfulness in a jar. Genifique by Lancome. The best of the season, all in the Lancome Beauty Box, only at Macy's. This Thanksgiving, get the centerpiece that everyone's talking about. Edible Arrangements bouquets are as beautiful as flowers, but more unique because they're made from delicious fresh fruit. You can even add chocolate. Centerpieces start at just $47. The holidays are here. Order your Thanksgiving centerpiece or holiday gifts now and save 10%. So make the holidays special. Visit, call, or see more unique gift ideas at ediblearrangements.com slash gifts. We are talking one big job. Uh, I, I call it the little huge house. Six months, lots of work, lots of people, probably in the area of 100 different men in that house. It's hot, I'm tired, but I'm happy. I think that's them right there. Frustrating. Day in, day out, especially near the end. The last three weeks have been hectic. Uh, I, I, I can't say that enough. I didn't look yet. I didn't look yet. Oh, you got your eyes closed? I didn't look yet. We're not looking. Can right. I look now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my oh. God. <laughs> you didn't look coming yeah, up the hill? No, <laughs> I didn't. I turned my eyes. <laughs> you didn't look. I wonder why I keep doing this. You know, I really do. Why am I here? You know, I'm, I'm flying back and forth. I'm working back home. I'm coming here. And then you bring them home. You want to come take a look? Uh, oh, yeah, look, I brought this for the front door. I can't cross the threshold without it. Home's sweet home. <laughs> huh? After oh you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Welcome home. Oh, my. I had the opportunity to meet new people here. And I'm, I'm talking about new people that actually care about someone. Welcome home. Thank you, James. Because of James being behind me, beside me, in front of me, helping me help this family, I found the right people. And at the end, awesome. We've been so busy, working so hard, trying to get it done, and all of a sudden, it came to a sudden stop. And that was my feelings right now. It's like, whoa, you know, everything's done. Let's go up to your office first, okay? Your office, you. your, after you, honey, it's your office. Oh, look at this wall. <gasps> oh, oh, wow. This is beautiful. Look at this wall. <laughs> Let's step out on your new deck. Oh, my gosh. Look at this. Wow. What is that, Mike? Now, this is a teak uh, flooring oh. which goes over top. It's a floating floor. And the idea is that we do not want to damage your uh, waterproof system as well as we want drainage. So James has sloped this in two directions with your glass rails. How do you like your glass rails? I love rails? my this glass is rails. Everyone's stepping up to the plate. And then I got guys like Matt, who knows the family.
Committee will come to order. Tracking the money, how Recovery Act recipients account for the use of stimulus dollars. I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. Today, the committee continues its oversight of the largest spending bill in our nation's history, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Nine months ago, it appeared that our national economy was spiraling out of control with nothing to slow the free fall. Now, with the help of the Recovery Act, our economy may be on the brink of recovery. This is the fourth in a series of hearings that examines the unprecedented rescue plan to jumpstart our economy. Heal the hemorrhaging, labor market, prevent drastic cuts in state budgets, and provide much needed assistance to our nation's working families. With nearly $790 billion in taxpayers' money on the line, the Recovery Act mandated extraordinary accountability and transparency provisions. Among these requirements, Section 1512 of the Act obligates recipients to report on the use of certain recovery funds. On October 30th, the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, Recovery Board, released their first recipient reports. And today, the GAO will release its first report analyzing the reporting process and the results. The recipient's report indicate that the Recovery Act has directly created or saved approximately 640,000 jobs, and about 400,000 of those jobs are in education or construction. In my home state of New York, 40,000 jobs reportedly have been created or saved by Recovery Act funding. And in New York City, job placement in the third quarter were up 60 percent from last year with 3,043 jobs placement in Brooklyn alone. In downtown Brooklyn, the long stall revitalization project, City Point, has been resurrected and will generate more than 300 construction jobs and 100 permanent jobs. Additionally, Recovery Act funds are being used to build nearly 740 affordable homes in Harlem and Brooklyn, generating 2,800 new jobs. While stories like this are very encouraging, I am gravely concerned that the unemployment rate is now 10.2 percent, the highest in 26 years. It is, it is even, <clears throat> excuse me, it is even higher for African Americans and Hispanic Americans, for people who have lost their jobs, it is not very comforting uh, to say we are making progress. Uh, nevertheless, the experts tell us that employment recovery historically lags behind economic recovery. According to Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, if the stimulus package did not exist, our nation's unemployment situation would be far worse. And on the positive side, in the third quarter of this year, we saw the first growth in GDP in over a year. That being said, today's hearing confronts the question, how do we know the Recovery Act is really working? The truth of the matter is that while recipients report, reports provided for an unprecedented level unprecedented level of transparency, we must be able to rely on the reported data. At this point, it is clear that errors found by GAO and others should be corrected immediately. Not months later, not, no matter how difficult, recipient reporting should be subject to strict quality control. The American taxpayers expects reporting to be done and done well, and $787 billion weighing in the balance is certainly far from just general pocket change. Taken as a whole, the big picture seems to indicate that the job trend is positive. Overall, there are some signs that jobs are finally being created, both as a direct and indirect result of Recovery Act spending. 
But while we are on the brink of recovery, we have a long way to go. The important message that I get from these recipient reports is that we need to sp spend Recovery Act money on projects that actually create jobs. We need to get the money out there faster, and we need to make sure it is targeted on economically di in to economically distressed areas. And we certainly need to make sure it is properly accounted for. I'm looking forward uh, today to, to assurance from our witnesses that there is a sense of urgency to do that. In addition, I think the Congress working with, I think the Congress working with the President really needs to focus on the need for further job creation over the next several weeks. The American people are really hurting. And again, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to your testimony. At this time, I yield five minutes to the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all the members of the administration for being here. I want to first preface by saying that uh, recovery.gov is the right idea in reportability. It's a new idea, and there are going to be bugs. I think we all recognize that we're not going to get it right the first time, but we can and must continue to make transparency in government not just a goal, but a reality. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased that we have a panel of witnesses before us today who can answer questions about why, passage, why after the passage of $787 billion stimulus, uh, substantial job creation has not occurred, and why members of the administration are peddling false save jobs created. You yourself used the 640,000 jobs created number, a number that is still on the board even though it has been discredited by both public and private sources. The American people, Mr. Chairman, are suffering. We learned this month that another 190,000 people joined the ranks of the unemployed, bringing the total number of jobs lost since President Obama took office to 3.8 million jobs, or 10.2 percent of the workforce. If you're that 10.2 percent, or an African American and a 15 percent unemployment, or an African American youth and a 50 percent unemployment, it's 100 percent unemployment to you. We are. <coughs> We, we all remember, Mr. President, the stimulus pitch, a promise that unemployment would never rise above 7.8 percent and the stimulus would save 3.5 to 4 million jobs. By the President's own metrics, this policy has been an object failure. Vice President Biden, who is responsible, has in fact been the chief misread reader of the economy by his own statements. If he had ever met with the chairman and myself on this issue, we certainly would have told him that, in fact, we needed to work more closely together and we needed not to predict these numbers without science. Then the same economists that misread the economy are creating a, pol a policy of miscalculation of what to do next, and steps in the, in the recovery will clearly be in the wrong direction. The administration continues to misread the economy and misunderstand the nature of economic growth. They also continue to mislead the American people with the faulty jobs claims that missed the steps that the country needed for an economic recovery. The, the administration continues to rely on the discredited economic theory that puts misplaced belief in government spending on pet projects, and in this case, taking credit for jobs saved that are substantially government jobs. School teachers are important, federal workers are important, but that's really where this has gone rather than to the economic growth that this country is, is famous for. Unfortunately, the main thing about the stimulation of the policy is, in fact, the size of government. Reports indicate that over half the jobs claimed so far have been in the public sector. The federal government uh, stands to grow by 140,000 permanent jobs by 2010. Clearly, the federal government is not feeling pain. Unemployment here in the nation's capital is 4 percent. And we have to keep in mind that taxpayers' money is, in fact, by definition, always being wasted in government programs. We try to keep it to a minimum. Clearly, it happens. If our stimulus had been one in which we allowed the American people to make their own determinations and simply supported them in that through investment tax credits and other systems that have historically worked, 
we would be only having the IRS making sure they truthfully made the investments. We wouldn't be trying to figure out whether, where the California 99th Congressional District is, which, by the way, I hope it's a Republican district. Perhaps, perhaps most relevant in today's hearing is the fact that the administration continues to try to cover up its mistakes with misleading job claims. Recovery.gov currently proclaims 640,000 to 329 jobs have been created or saved by the stimulus. Well, the administration has continued to bra brag, about, brag about this number as a fact, reports have indicated that it's wildly inaccurate. The whole jobs created saves metrics is not only troubled, it is entirely deceitful. No government agency, private sector group, or research economics has any idea what the reliable calculation track for these numbers would be. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put up at this time the Oxford English Dictionary definition of propaganda. Propaganda, a noun. Information especially of a biased or misleading nature used to promote a political cause or point of view. Mr. Chairman, it is very clear today, not by the witnesses here, not by, in fact, recovery.gov directly, but by how this is being treated, how these jobs are being continued to be claimed, and how, in fact, we are dealing with 3.8 million lost jobs, and yet we are told to focus on the 640,000 saved jobs and how much worse it would be. Mr. Chairman, that is propaganda, plain and clear. The administration has to go back to the facts. As I said in my first part of my opening statement, I support the work of recovery.gov trying to bring the facts to us and recognize there will be mistakes. But the fact is they have no idea how many jobs have been saved or created. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Um, now we'll move to our witnesses. Mr. Earl Devaney is the chairman of the Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency Board. Some people refer to it as RAT. Uh, I, I'm not going to call it RAT. Uh, of course, um, uh, which is the body created by the Recovery Act to ensure transparency in the use of recovery funds and prevent the waste, fraud, and abuse of those taxpayer dollars. Prior to being named as chairman of the Recovery Board, Mr. Devaney served as the Inspector General of the Department of the Interior. Mr. Devaney has also served as the Director of the Office of Criminal Enforcement, Forensic and Training for the Environmental Protection Agency, and as an officer in the Secret Service. Welcome, Mr. Devaney. Look Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your testimony. Mr. Gene Dodaro is the Acting Comptroller General of the Government Accountability Office. Mr. Dodaro has held this position since March the 13th, 2008. Mr. Dodaro's career is well seasoned, spanning over 30 years of service at GAO. Over the course of the last nine years, Mr. Dodaro has held a number of key senior level positions, including Chief Operating Officer and Head of the GAO's Accounting and Information Management Division. Welcome, Mr. Dodaro. The Honorable John Pocari is the Deputy Secretary of Transportation and is responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of the Department. Previously, Mr. Pocari served as Secretary of Maryland's Department of Transportation and was Assistant Secretary of Economic Development Policy at the Maryland Department of Business and Economic Development. Welcome. Mr. Pocari. The Honorable Wilder Miller was confirmed in July as the Deputy Secretary of Education. Uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of Education. And Mr. Miller serves as the Department's Chief Operating Officer. Deputy Secretary Miller has previously worked with the Los Angeles Unified School District, the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, and serve as an ex officio member of the Board of Education for the City of Los Angeles Budget and Finance Committee. We welcome you to uh, this hearing today. Uh, as long-standing procedure, we always swear our witnesses in. So if you would be kind enough to stand and raise your right hand.
You agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. You may be seated. So why don't we just go right down the line? We start with you, Mr. Dodaro, and just come right down the line. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to you, Ranking Member Issa, members of the uh, committee. I'm very pleased to be here today to have the opportunity to talk about GAO's views and suggestions regarding the first set of recipient reports filed under the Recovery Act. Given the national scope of this activity and a relatively limited time frame to stand up the original reporting system, we think it was a good uh, first start. However, there are a number of significant data quality uh, and reporting issues that must be addressed. Uh, based on our initial analysis, for example, of the uh, database that was released on October 30th, uh, we found that there were some uh, erroneous or questionable uh, information uh, in the database that merits additional scrutiny. Uh, for example, we found about 4,000 reports that uh, had no money expended uh, but yet claimed over 50,000 FTEs that had been reported. There are other reports where money has been expended, uh, but the uh, um, no FTEs have been reported uh, under those reports. So this needs additional scrutiny and examination to determine uh, the validity of that information. Uh, secondly, the coverage, uh, OMB estimates that about 90 percent of the recipients reported, but questions remain about the remaining 10 percent of the recipients that uh, should have reported uh, but potentially uh, did not. There's also questions about the quality of the review uh, that was done by federal uh, departments and agencies and by prime recipients. While over 75 percent of the reports were reviewed by federal agencies, uh, close to one in five uh, were not, uh, and far fewer reviews were done and documented in the system by the prime recipients, and so that needs further inquiry uh, and investigation as well. Uh, another uh, problem that we identified, and this was a, a fairly significant one, dealt with the different interpretations of full-time equivalent positions that were due to be reported. There was a lot of inconsistent application uh, regarding this, especially as it related to the time period in which people made the calculations. Uh, this area, uh, because of the different interpretation, really compromises the ability to aggregate the information uh, across the recipient reports. Now, we made a series of recommendations to OMB to work with uh, the Recovery Board and federal departments and agencies. Uh, first is to clarify and standardize the definition of full-time equivalent positions and set a standard period of measurement so the information can be collected and accumulated uh, consistently and, and, and properly. Also to be clearer in the guidance about the fact that the reporting focuses on hours worked uh, that need to be uh, reported in a consistent manner. We also believe that given the issues that we and others have identified that OMB should work with the federal agency establishment and with the prime recipients to review lessons learned under this first reporting uh, exercise and reevaluate their quality assurance uh, and reporting approaches uh, to make necessary modifications uh, to ensure that these data quality and reporting issues are addressed uh, successfully. Uh, because this is a uh, cumulative reporting uh, approach uh, and GAO is required to review each of the quarterly reports that are filed by the recipients acts, we will be following up uh, on this, conducting additional analysis and making uh, further reports to this committee and to the Congress regarding the extent to which these data quality and reporting issues are addressed. I think it's important to address these issues both for the current set of recipients that are filing reports, but also there will be new recipients that were not file, did not have to file reports now as the recovery money gets spent over fiscal year 2010 and 2011, there will be many more recipients 
uh, filing, and those areas need to be addressed as well to prevent future problems from emerging in this area. So I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to summarize our findings. I'd be happy to respond to questions at the appropriate point in time. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodaro. Uh, Chairman Devaney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Iser, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the activities of the Recovery Board and, in particular, the recipient reporting period that just ended October 30th. After I have made my opening remarks, I will be glad to answer any questions you might have. Much has transpired since the last time I testified before this committee in March, but I will start with a discussion of recipient reporting. Overall, the Board's Mr. two Devaney, websites, Mr. the Devaney, inbound. Will you, will you put your mic just a little closer? Okay. Thank you. The inbound. Uh, reporting website, federalreporting.gov, and the public-facing portal, recovery.gov, worked together as intended during this first reporting period. On October 1st, recipients of recovery funds began reporting on their use of the funds, and between October 1st and October 30th, over 130,000 prime and subprime recipient award reports were filed. Since this was the first time that recipients were submitting data reports, and some states had in, been encountering technical challenges in filing bulk reports for the recipients, the Board decided to have a 10-day grace period where late filers were permitted to submit their required quarterly reports after the due date. However, they also re were required to explain their reasons for the delayed reporting. Beginning October 11th, OMB and the awarding agencies began the review of the recipient reports, providing comments and posing questions to recipients. Following this data quality review, prime recipients and sub-recipients worked to make corrections identified by the awarding agencies. As a result, about 21 percent of the recipient reports were modified. These changes are chronicled on a separate web page for all users to see and are downloadable for more experienced users. While there were very few technical difficulties with the reporting prior process, that is not to say that recipients did not encounter problems either in reporting or their ability to digest the guidance. As you undoubtedly know, OMB created a large amount of guidance on reporting. However, there were apparently still some reporting questions the recipients were unable to solve as GAO chronicled in their most recent report. Accordingly, we will continue to play an active role with OMB in crafting solutions to help resolve those reporting problems. Mr. Chairman, I believe these reporting problems can be divided into two categories. Inactive da inaccurate data and noncompliance. First, the data reported was riddled with inaccuracies and contradictions. For example, a misplaced decimal made it look as though a company had awarded a $10 billion, was awarded a $10 billion contract when it had really been awarded a $10 million contract. Another obvious error, more than one entity put dollars awarded in the data field for jobs created or saved. Even more notorious were significant errors relating to congressional districts. These mistakes do not surprise me, however, and in a way they are not unequivocally bad. In reality, this data should serve in the long run as evidence of what transparency can achieve. In the past, this data would have been scrubbed from top to bottom before its release, and the agencies would never have released the information until it was near perfect. You and the American public are now seeing what agencies have seen internally for years. And what we are all seeing, at least following this first reporting period, is not particularly pretty. This raw form, unsanitized data may cause embarrassment for some agencies and recipients. But my expectation is that any embarrassment suffered will encourage self-correcting behavior and lead to better reporting in the future. In addition to incorrect data, the second major reporting problem was the considerable amount of non-reporting. The Board believes that the number of non-reporting recipients exceeds early OMB estimates. But we have not yet received their list. Given my decades of law enforcement experience, it should come as no surprise to anybody that I personally favor a penalty of some sort for non-compliers. The Recovery Act prescribes no penalties for failure to report, but perhaps an amendment to that effect would be something for Congress to consider. Even if criminal, cr criminal penalties are not practical, the fact that some would willfully not file is distressing and must be addressed. Agencies, at a minimum, will need to decide what actions they are willing to take to ensure that transparency and accountability aims of the Recovery Act are not disregarded. 
Perhaps an agency could refuse to provide any additional funds to a noncompliant recipient or demand that noncompliant recipients return funds not yet spent. For the Board's part, we intend to post those recipient names prominently on recovery.gov. Although the website presents the most visible aspect of the Board's work, the transparency it provides is only half of the Board's dual mission of transparency and accountability. Over the past several months, we have also made great strides in furthering our goal of accountability and oversight. Simply stated, the Board will now be utilizing recently procured software tools and analytical tools to provide an in-depth fraud analysis that interfaces with 8.5 million public records with the recipient data to help identify non-obvious relationships. We believe these non-obvious relationships would unveil facts that may have not been transparent to government officials at the time the contract or grant award was made. Today I can assure you that every recipient of a contractor grant or loan under the Recovery Act is being processed through this sophisticated multifaceted system. To further assist our accountability mission, the Board has implemented a robust hotline solution where citizens can reach us by phone, electronically, fax, or regular mail. To date, we have received more than 350 citizen complaints. As you might expect, not all of these are concerned actual fraud, waste, or mismanagement, but those that did have been referred by our hotline staff to the appropriate IG for further inquiry. Meanwhile, the rest of the IG community has been working diligently to manage its recovery-related oversight responsibilities with approximately 77 investigations having been opened and more than 390 audits, evaluations, and reviews are underway. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to conclude today with my oral remarks with a thought about transparency. I believe that the principal downside of transparency is embarrassment, and there is enough of that here to go all around. All of those involved, including the board I chair, will need to dedicate themselves to improve the quality of the data in the days and the weeks ahead. However, if I've learned anything yet about transparency, it's that it's harder to practice transparency than it is to talk about transparency. It's definitely not something for the faint of heart. Mr. Chairman, I will now be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Delaney. Uh, Deputy Secretary Miller. Uh, thank you, Chairman Towns, uh, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee. Uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act provides nearly $100 billion in funding to the Department of Education. This is to help avert layoffs of teachers, school personnel, and other public employees while advancing critical education reforms. We've distributed more than $67 billion of these funds, and recipients have reported saving or creating almost 400,000 jobs, including jobs for more than 300,000 teachers and others in public schools and in our colleges. The first Recovery Act funds released were supplements to existing formula grant programs, such as Title I and the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. These programs have well-developed monitoring systems and regulatory requirements that control expenditures, thus minimizing the risk of misuse. The next round of awards were made under the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund. This fund was used to support grants to help stabilize state and local government budgets in order to minimize reductions in education and other essential public services. This was done in exchange for a commitment to advance essential education reforms. We were able to obligate these funds quickly by taking advantage of the Department's existing grant administration systems and working closely with OMB to ensure compliance with the statutory requirements. A percentage of the stabilization fund was withheld for a Phase II application, which requires states to be transparent about their education reform efforts. Governors will need to provide data on four key areas of school reform as outlined by Congress in the Recovery Act. Those are achieving equity in teacher distribution, improving the collection and use of data, implementing high standards and high quality assessments, and turning around our most struggling schools. The phase two requirements were published in the Federal Register on November 12th, and applications are due on January 11th. The remaining Recovery Act funding, which has yet to be released, is for discretionary grants, including the Race to the Top Fund and the Investing in Innovation Fund. The requirements for Race to the Top were posted on the Department's website on November 12th, and applications are due on January 19th. The Department is continuing to work hard to provide guidance and technical assistance to our grant recipients on the reporting requirements. We publish detailed official guidance and are holding bi-weekly webinars and conducting significant outreach with state and local leaders to ensure that recipients are well aware of the Recovery Act's unique reporting requirements. 
We are keeping the lines of communications open with grantees, and when clarification is needed, we are responding quickly and publicly. To ensure adequate financial systems and control of these funds, the Department utilizes its centralized grants, administration, and payment system, a system known as GAPS internally. At any time, we know exactly how much funding has been awarded to any grantee and how much funding has been drawn down. With GAPS, we not only screen any grantee requests for funds to be drawn down, but we also require grantees to certify that they will use the funds within three business days as required by the Cash Management Improvement Act. GAPS also has an excessive payments monitoring feature that requires Recovery Act payments over a set amount to be approved by the program office before those funds can be drawn down, as opposed to being drawn down automatically. We are expanding this process to apply all Department funds, not just Recovery Act funds. In our ongoing effort to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse of Recovery Act funds, our Office of Inspector General is a significant asset. ROIG has held more than 160 meetings with state and local officials on issues related to the Recovery Act. They have conducted audits in seven states in Puerto Rico to assess their internal control systems for administering the Recovery Act funds. To ensure that their findings inform program implementation, the OIG staff are in regular contact with staff offices across the Department to alert them to potential issues in the field. OIG intends to initiate additional audits in the coming months, increasing its focus on the use of funds and data quality. And the Recovery Act's recipient reporting provides a new tool in our efforts to ensure transparency. For the first time, grantees are required to provide quarterly reports, as you know, that account for their use of these funds. We are making considerable efforts to ensure recipients' compliance with the reporting requirements and help maximize the accuracy of their data. Due in large part to our extensive guidance and outreach effort, the Department achieved virtually 100 percent compliance with the reporting requirements among state agencies. A relatively small number of local level recipients encounter technical challenges in their reporting efforts, and the Department is working closely with them and any other recipients experiencing difficulties to ensure full compliance in the next round of reporting. The Department has forwarded to the Recovery Board any significant errors and material omissions that have been corrected, such as discrepancies in award size or funding agency. In instances where job data was flagged as being outside of the anticipated range, the Department has notified the recipient of the concern, provided a link to the relevant guidance, and maintained a record of how the guidance was being interpreted so that it could be clarified in the coming months. We will also develop a lesson learned document and begin another round of outreach in advance of the next period of reporting. In summary, as we work to refine the data reporting process, it is important to recognize the impressive level of transparency that has already been achieved. Every parent can go to recovery.gov and see how much the Recovery Act funding their school district have received. If any vendor receives more than $25,000 in payments, that information is available as well. This transparency provides an important tool for taxpayers to see how public funds are being used in their communities and is a significant deterrent against fraud. In closing, I believe that the Department has been highly effective in implementing and overseeing its Recovery Act funds. We have received considerable feedback from our grantees on the guidance we provided. We will continue to work to improve data quality and further the unprecedented level of transparency. Moreover, we are confident that the Recovery Act has succeeded in keeping hundreds of thousands of teachers and other staff in schools, helping to ensure that despite the significant budget crisis that states face, our children can continue to get the education they need and deserve to prepare them for the future. Thank you again, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Miller. Uh, Deputy Secretary Picara. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. Let me begin by sharing information about our progress in implementing this historic legislation. The Department of Transportation received $48.1 billion in resources to support infrastructure improvements and create and sustain jobs throughout the transportation sector. In the 38 weeks following enactment, we have obligated a total of $30.3 billion on more than 10,000 projects nationwide. More than 5.5 billion of these resources have been expended and more than 6,500 projects are underway or completed. In addition, work is underway to prepare for the award of the $8 billion the Recovery Act provided for high-speed passenger rail. On a parallel track, we are internally reviewing the applications for the $1.5 billion provided to the Department in discretionary grants. We expect to award these grants in January 2010, ahead of the February 17th deadline. Overall, the Department has made substantial progress in implementing the Recovery Act, and the Secretary and I are very proud of these accomplishments. 
Recovery Act funds are improving our transportation infrastructure while putting people back to work in cities and counties throughout the nation. As I travel around the country, I've talked with construction workers who have shared with me how difficult it was to provide for their families until they were employed or re-employed after being laid off on a Recovery Act project. This program has been an economic lifeline for people like Brandon Nestler, a construction site foreman from Wisconsin who was laid off last year after 18 years of service until a recovery funded project put him back to work full time overseeing grading work on I-94. Allison Barber, a new college graduate with a degree in construction management, had few job prospects until a construction company hired her as a full time foreman on a major road project in Colorado. These workers and many thousands like them can look forward to a paycheck and ensure that their families have the resources they need. There's no question the Recovery Act is working as intended, putting America's to, Americans to work while making long-term investments in our infrastructure. Equally important is DOT's commitment to ensuring that all these funds are spent wisely, that the program meets all federal reporting requirements, and that we're able to share accurate information with the American people about our progress. The Recovery Act requires, among other things, that funding recipients provide independent reports of the numbers of direct jobs created and other project-related information. Section 1512 of the Recovery Act requires recipients to report this information as of September 30th, 2009, and then again at the, each, at the end of each subsequent quarter through fiscal year 2010. Given that this reporting process was new for the recipient community, the Department of Transportation staff reached out to their state DOTs, affected transit and airport authorities, and Amtrak to assist them in understanding the reporting guidelines provided by the Office of Management and Budget. We also conducted a series of webinars and other training sessions to provide recipients with information needed to comply with the Section 1512 requirements. DOT staff continued to provide support to these recipients until the reporting database was closed on October 20th. As a result of these efforts, the recipient community for DOT reported 45,250 direct jobs created. Uh, DOT contractors reported more than 1,000 additional jobs. More than 96% of our recipient community successfully reported their data in the reporting system. Overall, we're pleased with the 1512 reporting and anticipate even more success in the future quarterly reporting. We're in the process of contacting the recipient community to identify any errors that could be corrected in the next reporting cycle. In addition, we're asking for their help in identifying recommended process improvements and lessons learned to simplify future reporting. As we begin planning for the next Section 1512 reporting cycle in January of 2010, we'll build upon our initial training and outreach efforts to help ensure success with the future recipient reporting requirements. This concludes my testimony, and I'll be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Let me thank all of you for your, your testimony. Um, we will start the questioning, and I'll, I'll start off. Uh, I guess let me just direct this to you, Mr. Dodaro, and also to you, uh, Ms. Devaney. Uh, I mean, we all know in terms of um, how important this is, but is it really creating jobs? Jobs being created out of the stimulus package? Well, I think it's clear that the, the use of, of the money is intended for that purpose. The real question that we we're looking at in this case is what's the accuracy of the information that's that's being reported and the accuracy of the information needs to be improved and that that would I say would be the bottom line because there, but you do think jobs are being created well uh, the funds are being used for the appropriate purposes from what we've we've seen but the question is uh, you know how many jobs would be created or not there, there are several dimensions of this first of all of the amount the 787 billion dollars that is estimated to be spent. As of the reporting period here, only 22 percent of that amount of money had been spent as of September 30th. So it was $173 billion. Point number two is that that was spent both in the tax cuts, the entitlement programs, unemployment insurance, Medicaid, and others, and then in grants, contracts, and, and, and other things. The, the recipient reports only deal with the grants and contracts. So of the $173 billion that's been spent under the Recovery Act, only $47 billion is uh, subject to the reporting requirements under the Act. So even if you get an accurate count 
under the recipient reports, it's still a subset and it only focuses on job creation. Uh, and we think and may, we believe we made good recommendations to improve the accuracy so that there's a better basis for making informed judgments about how many jobs were created or saved. Mm -hmm. Mr. Devaney? Oh, I think I would agree totally with that. I think there's probably no doubt jobs are being created or saved. It's just the number and the accuracy of the number. We have a number. Uh, it's based on what the recipients told us uh, their interpretation of the guidance was. And uh, as the uh, acting controller suggests, um, that guidance needs to be clarified in a, in a big way, in a big hurry, to help recipients be a lot clearer uh, the next time they report. Uh, I have no doubt that there's a lot of jobs being created. I think it could be above or below 640. I think missing reports might drive the job numbers up. And I think there's enough inaccuracies in here to question the 640 number. It might go down. So it's somewhere in the middle there is, is a balancing act. And, and as the quarters go on and as the accuracy gets better <laughs> and recipients get better at reporting accurately, I think we'll get a much better picture. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the first time. And there were a lot of challenges for both recipients and, and agencies, and quite frankly, for my board. So um, my hope is that as we go forward, this is all going to get better. Right. You know, um, uh, the non-compliance, do you think that's the fact in terms of um, the lack of staff or being an unfunded mandate? Uh, what do you think um, 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 uh, that really sort of creates the non-compliance? Do you think that they're overworked? Are the, the requests just too much for them to handle at this time? Uh, I'm trying to get a handle on because yeah. I like the idea when you indicated the fact that maybe some kind of penalty. And as you know, that uh, the ranking member in this, this committee has put forth legislation, you know, trying to create some relief. You know, uh, and of course, that's one reason, another reason why I have, you know, interest in this. And of course, maybe get your response even to our legislation. I think there's, there's, there's probably a number of reasons why reporters, uh, why recipients didn't report. Um, it could be as simple as they didn't want to. Uh, two, they were confused and didn't know they had to. Um, there are no penalties. And in that kind of a situation, just my enforcement background leads to, be, to believe that uh, penalties are a deterrent effect. And if there were some, I think we would have gotten better compliance. Um, but um, the fact is, I'm still trying to get a handle on how many didn't. Um, I think uh, Mr. Dodaro suggested that it may be as high as 10%. Um, I'm in that range, our, we're in that range ourselves. That's a little higher than what OMB's uh, early estimates are, but I'm waiting for that list. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, um, um, uh, Mr. Pocari, did you indicate in terms of your, your situation has been very different? I understand you said 96 percent. Yes, Mr. Chairman. We, we uh, of our 1,037 recipients that we required to report, 96 percent uh, did. And, and I would point out that they are widely varying in capability. Some were very large state DOTs. Uh, we also had uh, municipalities like High Point, North Carolina, where you had one person who was uh, planning, designing, bidding the project, and doing all the reporting requirements. Uh, and we believe that is one of the reasons that uh, um, uh, th that four percent were not able to report. Right. I yield to the gentleman from California, the ranking member. I thank I you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Devaney, uh, Secretary LaHood uh, said. We know for a fact that Recovery Act investment have created or saved more than 640,000 direct jobs so far. These are real, identifiable jobs directly funded by the Act. Can you support that? Uh, well, I think, I think, sir, it may be a fact that that's what is on my website, uh, but that may not be the, right. uh, so, the correct so number. To, to characterize he may have been a little overzealous in saying real, identifiable, direct, and in fact, it's just a damn estimate, isn't it? It's what the recipients reported. Okay. Uh, I was reminded, by the way, that when a fish hit a, hits a wall, he says, damn. Uh, 
That's what we're talking about here. Okay, so going through a couple of slides, uh, the uh, White House Press Secretary, Robert Gibbs, on October 30th, 2009, says the direct jobs in that, in that is, is, again, 640,329, referring to recovery.gov. Same day, uh, Vice President Biden's chief economic advisor, those jobs <coughs> accumulate to 650,000 jobs saved or created so far. Same day, Vice President Joe Biden. When the data is posted later today, it will show that we have created or saved 640,239 jobs directly from contracting authority with the federal government. Last slide, CNN. Headline, stimulus creates 640,000 jobs. Pull up the propaganda again. Is there any reason when you don't know what the number really is that it's just an estimate that, in fact, there's about 60,000 jobs you pulled off, and you didn't even pull off the 26,000 jobs the University of California says it claims, which would be half of its employees, were saved by this act, and they don't have a net new hiring, so you had to save existing employees, half of them. Isn't that just propaganda? Isn't it either misleading or, or designed to serve a political agenda when, in fact, it can't be substantiated, it is, not in, it is not true, and it is either misleading or designed to say we're doing a great job when, in fact, we don't know? Mr. Devaney, you're the most honest man I know. <laughs> uh, without, without a whole lot of in-between, shouldn't we be more conservative and say, look, this is what the reports are, we're scrubbing it, this is a new system, it has its problems, we hope that at least they're reporting the dollars right, and we have no idea where, whether those people have the ability to calculate accurately the full-time time jobs equivalents, but we're going to get to the bottom of it. Wouldn't that be a fairer way to put it? I like that statement. Thank you, Mr. Devaney. Uh, now, I said to begin with that I commend you for what you're doing, and I'm going to concentrate really on the fact that we know this is, that the output is propaganda. We know we lost 3.8 million jobs. We know, for example, Secretary Miller, when he says he saved 300,000 jobs, these are simply transfers to pay for teachers. So it's not created. It's simply they, weren't, they, they are alleged not to be laid off. The money was moved to other parts of the budget. So those teachers kept the job, and the state spent the same money they would have spent on teachers somewhere else. That's a reality of those 300,000 jobs. So now let's get down to the real question, which is, can you, with the money you have, Mr. Devaney, improve your site to have back engine capability so that when somebody puts an erroneous number in, when somebody puts in a number that doesn't jibe with what they were given, when somebody puts in a congressional district that doesn't exist, and I know you've scrubbed that now, but can you have the engine fact check it so that it comes back and says, hold it, you have these corrections. When I try to put the wrong credit card number in, I get a, I get a bounce back when I, when I try to buy online. Can you do that with the money you have today, or should Congress be giving you more dollars so that your prototype for online reporting in government can become robust enough to be everyone's prototype? I think we can do that, sir, and I, th I don't think we need any more money to do it. Um, to be quite honest with you, I think we needed this first quarter to totally understand which pieces of the data were going to cause the most problems, so now that we know. Uh, we're doing that analysis. We, we certainly intend to build what we call internal logic checks into the system. So, for instance, if a uh, congressional district is selected that does not correspond with the zip code that's also put in there, uh, there's a bong that goes off somewhere and, uh, and the recipient is asked to, to spend some more time and come up with the right congressional district. One quick last follow-up. Will you also be producing the kind of software that would allow a single recipient trying to do their job and report properly to be able to do it at, at little or no cost? Will you create that so that the downstream, because I know the Department of Transportation, most of those people reported because they're used to reporting. It's, it's pretty similar to what they've been doing. Can you create the ability to enable more and more people to be able to report accurate by delivering additional uh, capability to them downstream? Is that part of your plan? Um, well, we certainly work uh, literally constantly with the states. And, and, and bear in mind, on this first reporting, uh, 31 states chose to do bulk reporting. 
and uh, literally report for everybody in their state, all the recipients. And uh, that actually um, enabled us to work with the, the people that were doing the reporting. And I think it worked well. I think there were problems encountered that, uh, that we resolved rather quickly. So yes, it's a constant ongoing dialogue we're having with states and recipients. How can we make it better for you? And, and to the extent we can, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for the testimony here today. This is a difficult job that you all have, uh, but I think it's, uh, the transparency issue is critical, and I, I suspect that the American people are grateful for it. The Recovery Act funds are going to amount, apparently, about 10 percent of our deficit over the next 10 years. Uh, I wish that we had given scrutiny to the other 90 percent, which, of course, comes from the uh, one to three trillion dollars spent on the Iraq war, which obviously wasn't very well accounted for. Uh, the, you know, what will probably amount to over four to five trillion dollars for the 2001-2003 tax cuts, which weren't paid for. Uh, and we can go on and on uh, with what brought us to this point. Uh, but I think it's very important that we have this transparency and accountability, and I thank all of you for doing that. But let me ask you, Mr. Devaney, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act contained certain Buy America requirements. Uh, that was intended to ensure that the stimulus money was spent uh, on U.S. companies. The law also allowed for agency heads to uh, waive those requirements if it met certain criteria. Uh, and I wanted to know whether or not you were aware that five agencies have granted more than two dozen exceptions to that Buy American rule. I'm aware that agencies are giving waivers. Okay. Uh, is it concerning to you at all that the information about those waivers um, is not really available on the recovery.gov? Uh, I think that's something we should probably get and put on recovery.gov. So if I'm clear, in your opinion at least, it would increase transparency on the use of the recovery funds to have uh, the information on those waivers and the rationale uh, and the amount that's expected to be spent on foreign-made goods noted publicly on recovery.com? I agree with that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, did you find that there was inadequate monitoring of subrecipients by the states? We're, we're continuing to look, to look at that issue. We do the bi-monthly reviews on the use of the money. There have been some concerns that we've reported in our earlier reports about the need to have better reporting or to ensure reporting on subrecipients. So we're continuing to look at that issue as part of our bi-monthly reports on the uses of the money by selected states and localities. Our next scheduled report there is due uh, this in early December, and so we'll be talking about that then. For this report, we focused on analyzing the database of the recipient reports, but we're very much attuned to that issue. It's very important, particularly where there are known uh, reporting uh, issues or known problems with some subrecipients. For example, HUD has identified high-risk subrecipients in the public housing authorities, there's some concerns in the local education agencies. So 